The Thursday dinner review might be moved to a new night. The swim classes for my children keep changing throughout the year as to what day they're meeting and what time. All the parents are complaining and they don't seem to care that the parents are complaining. And so I am not sure what's going on with that. The Sable lunch will be this Friday. I think the topic is going to be game theory and you know, applications of game theory to tennis. Uh, there will be a probable exam on chapters 11 and 12 on Friday the 15th right before spring break. My feeling is you would much rather have an exam right before spring break than right when you get back from spring break. If people would like an exam after spring break as well, let me know and I can try to give a personalized exam to welcome you back to the Purple Bubble. Uh, finally, in honor of this being the worst lecture of the semester, I have chocolate for everybody. It's sitting in the cabinet at my house. So at some point I will remember during the semester to bring in the chocolate for you. I do feel, however, that it is probably best not to have chocolate in this lecture and to just have this lecture as painful as possible and just, you know, have just this one day and just get it over with. So the goal is at all costs we must finish the chain rule today. We cannot let this go over to two days. As always, when we try to understand something in several variables, what's our default start? Yes? One dimension. So what I'm going to do is I am going to prove the chain rule in full glory and glory in one dimension and essentially say almost nothing about the proof in several variables. I'll talk a little bit about how you would generalize. I have six pages of notes that I sadly wrote before I knew tech. Tech is what allows me to have this beautiful mathematically you know, set stuff. It was written in Microsoft Word. So I do apologize and you can actually see now the difference between Microsoft Word and tech. But you know, if you want, the full details of the proof are there. I'm also happy to meet either individually or if a lot of people are interested, you know, give a private lecture on how would you rigorously prove the chain rule in several variables. There's one new step that you need over the proof in one dimension. I want to emphasize what's going on in one dimensions. I want to emphasize common pitfalls. And I want to talk about applications. So out of curiosity, what's the derivative of e to the x? How many of you have seen a definition of e to the x? So you know the derivative of e to the x is, is e to the x, and you can't define e to the x. Shame, right? You should not be lemmingly following instructors. If they give you a function, you should know what it is. Okay? So I will explain a little bit today what is this function e to the x, one of the most important functions in mathematics. And I will show how the chain rule gives us incredible information about e to the x and its relation. All right, so theorem. Let's let f be a function from r to r. g is a function from r to r. And let's let h of x be f of g of x. Then h prime of x is f prime g of x times g prime of x. This is the chain rule. OK. So this is the hardest of all the differentiation rules from one dimensional calculus. <coughs> what I want to do first is go through some of the pitfalls in using it in one dimension. Of all the sections in our book, this is the one I probably hate the most. It has some really nice things to it, but it overloads notation in some places, and things can get confusing. I am going to deliberately overload notation here. At 10 o'clock, I accidentally overloaded notation, but now I'm going to do it knowingly. And I want you to see how bad notation can be. All right, so the first thing to think about is, in a statement of the chain rule, where are we evaluating? It's f prime at g of x. So the first most common mistake is people forget the g of x, and they say it's f prime of x. Let's think about this. For example, imagine f of x is the square root of x minus 2, and g of x is 10x. Can someone tell me what f of g of 1 would be? So f of g of 1. I'm sorry? Radical, Radical 8. And what about f of 1? Undefined. Undefined. I'm supposed to input a real number to f. I'm putting in the square root of negative 1. This is one of the most common mistakes. Just because f is defined at g of x does not mean f makes sense at x. So be very careful. Make sure you always evaluate f at g of x. 
And if you're evaluating f at g of x, then f prime must also be evaluated at the same point. You can't be moving the point where you are. This will become very important when we get to the chain rule in several variables. The next thing to remember is the following. Let's say h of x is x to the n. Can someone tell me what the derivative of x to the n is? OK. This one, OK. All right. I want more. I want more than just n x to the n minus 1. There's something else there. It's n x to the n minus 1 times times what? Times d, I'm sorry, I think I might have put it here, times what? dx d what? dx d. So dh dx is n x to the n minus 1 dx dx. Or I can just write it x prime. Now what's the derivative of x prime with respect to, what's the derivative of x with respect to x? 1. So this is the same as h prime of x is n x to the n minus 1 times 1. Nobody likes to write 1 when all you're doing is multiplying. So we all say, screw this, just write h prime of x is n x to the n minus 1. Why would we keep writing a times 1? Times 1 does nothing. Well, it may do nothing in terms of evaluating the function, but in terms of understanding what's going on in the generalization, this times 1 is very important. This times 1 is the g prime of x. Forgetting the g prime of x is the second most common mistake in applications of the chain rule. And you've really seen this g prime of x all the way back in Calc 1. When you saw the derivative of x to the n, however, it was kind of hidden because you just wrote it as 1. And so you're not going to bother writing 1. It kind of drops off the radar. But it's really floating there. So these are the two biggest mistakes. What I want to do now is proof of one-dimensional chain rule. And then I'll talk a little bit about how you would generalize to several variables. All proofs of differentiation laws in one variable calculus, they all start the same way. They start with the definition of the derivative. So h of x is going to be f of g of x. h prime of x is the limit, as h goes to 0, of f of g of x plus h minus f of g of x divided by h. Why does this notation suck? It's a technical math term. What is wrong with this notation? This notation is horrible. What is bad about this notation? Yes? I have two h's and they don't mean the same thing. This h is a function of x and this h is my little thing sending to zero. I'm overloading the symbol h. The book in the chain rule later overloads the symbol w. I don't like overloading. Now being in a blackboard it's very nice. h I can make into a very fancy a or maybe more like a Star Trek symbol by just kind of curving down like this. And so wherever I see an h all I have to do is do a little bit of work and I can convert it into the letter a. And my daughter Kayla has been trained that when she sees it, goes, Star Trek Daddy. It was the only time I've ever enjoyed Solowitz's works. Well, it's the most I've ever enjoyed his works. OK. So now I have my a prime of x equals this. All right. Now the following is false. But you know, when I go back to the dream world of mathematics, wouldn't it be wonderful if this was the same as the limit as h goes to 0 of f of g of x plus h minus f of g of x divided by h. I'm basically saying g of x plus h is g of x, and then add h onto that. Now this is, of course, false. But if this were true, what would this quantity equal? This would become what? One. Not 1. F is I'm sorry? F is no. no. I have f at g of x, I have f of g of x plus h, and I'm subtracting. And then I divide by h, and I take the limit. This should look a lot like a derivative of f. And the question is, where am I evaluating this derivative of f? 
at the point g of x, right? I have f at g of x plus a little bit minus f at g of x divided by h. This would become f prime at g of x. Now, of course, this is false, so this is not f prime of g of x, OK? But it gives you an inkling of what's going on and why the chain rule is as it is. That's the first piece in the chain rule. That's the f prime of g of x. The difference is I can't just say this is g of x plus h is g of x plus h. I have to correct a little bit. I have to think. So now let's go back. The derivative of a function b at a point a is the limit as h goes to 0 of b of a plus h minus b of a over h. This kind of looks like a derivative of f at the point g of x. But instead of doing a plus h, I'm evaluating f at a slightly different point. So this suggests a really clever multiplication by 1. And what I'm going to get is the following. a prime of x is the limit as h tends to 0 of f of g of x plus h <coughs> minus f of g of x divide by g of x plus h minus g of x. And now I have to multiply by what I divided by. So I multiply by g of x plus h minus g of x. And then I still have my h that I was dividing by. So I multiplied by 1. I did nothing. But I did nothing in a great way. As I take the limit as h goes to 0, what does this piece look like? As h goes to 0, what does this go to? So I have g of x plus h minus g of x over h, send h to 0. What does this piece go to? It's just <coughs> what? Zero. Not 0. The derivative of which function? The derivative of g at what point? At x. This is the definition of the derivative of g of x. The derivative of g of x, g prime of x, is g of x plus h minus g of x over h. If you look at this point over here, this is going to be the derivative of f at the point g of x. I start at the point g of x, I move a little bit over, and then I divide by how much I moved, and I take the limit as h goes to 0. Well, as h goes to 0, g of x plus h goes to g of x. So if you want, instead of looking at it as b of a is equal to this, b of a is equal to the limit as x goes to a of b of x over b of a over x minus a. That's another way of viewing the derivative. And so here, I have my point g of x, and I have another sequence of points. So this over here, as h goes to 0, is going to f prime at g of x. And so we get a prime of x is equal to f prime of g of x times g prime of x. And so I'm using the limit of a product is the product of the limits. And so normally I would write the end of proof symbol, but I'm going to put a question mark. There is one illegal step in what I've done. There is one dangerous thing that I have done. Whoever gets this right gets a homework exemption for the rest of the semester. What did I potentially do wrong? Yes. Nope, that's, you know, I multiplied by this, that became my g prime of x. Good try, but that wasn't it. What did I potentially do wrong? Good, who said that? All right, where did I potentially divide by 0? Well, again, h is never equal to 0. So you're very close. Can you fix it? How could I potentially be dividing by 0? What could give me a division by 0? What must happen to get a division by 0? Because, um, like, in general? Or? 
So how, how can I divide by 0? Tell me what would give me division by 0. Good. So if g of x equals g of x plus h, I've just divided by 0. And I lose my professorship in mathematics. I, I think physics or econ would give me amnesty. I have enough joint work. But I would no longer be able to teach in this part of Bonford. I, now the question is, could g of x plus h ever equal g of x? Yes. This is a technical point you have to be careful about. Now, if g of x plus h equals g of x, if it only happens for one value of h, that's fine. Just take h smaller. So the only time I'm in trouble is if this happens infinitely many times. Well, what would it mean if it happened infinitely many times? Well, if it happens infinitely many times, then this numerator is 0 infinitely many times. It's going to imply g prime of x is 0. Well, if g prime of x is 0, then by the chain rule, I'm supposed to be getting 0. So in the special case when this happens infinitely often, it turns out you're still OK. What if it doesn't happen infinitely often? Well, if g prime of x is non-zero, let's say it's 5. If g prime of x is 5, that means I'm increasing to the right and I'm decreasing to the left. So that means for small values of h, I can't have this equal to 0 because my function's increasing to the right. So if I only move a small amount, I don't have to worry about division. If I go back a little bit, g of x plus h will be smaller. If I go forward a little bit, g of x plus h will be larger. So these are just the technical issues you have to worry about. Again, whenever you do anything in mathematics that involves a division, you have to make sure you haven't divided by 0. Okay? So this is mostly the proof of the one variable chain rule. To do it in several variables, all you have to do is essentially do the same tricks, but you have to also add 0, which makes it a really beautiful proof because you're adding 0 and multiplying by 1. You're doing the two different things that give you nothing. Okay? So this is the chain rule. Let's see some applications of it. So the first is the exponential function. So let's let f of x equal e to the x. So you all should know the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. But what is the function e to the x? And please don't hand me your calculator and say, well, I just pressed this button. Right? What's the function e to the x? How is it defined? Do not be so trusting. How's the function? Do you know how the function is defined? Any? I'm sorry? These are natural numbers. Mm -hmm. So one possibility is to say it's a number raised. Um, but if x is an irrational number, we don't necessarily know what it means to raise a number to an irrational number. The way e to the x is defined is there's two definitions. One definition is e to the x is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus x over n to the n. This is one of the two definitions of e to the x. The other definition is e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, yada, 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 is the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of x to the n over n factorial. This is the other definition of e to the x. And for a lot of things in calculus, the series expansion is a lot easier to work with. So let's see what the derivative of e to the x is. So the derivative of e to the x. What's the derivative of 1? 0. I just realized some of you may not have seen the factorials. So as a quick factorial review, factorial review. n factorial is the number of ways of ordering n people when order matters. It's n times n minus 1 times 3 times 2 times 1. n factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial. So 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. 0 factorial is 1. So the last one is a definition. We can define 0 factorial however we want. How many ways are there to order a group of zero people when order matters? One. There is one way to do nothing. Okay? If you think that's funny, I have an even better joke. The following is true. Negative one-half factorial is the square root of pi. 
you really shouldn't be laughing. This is quite serious. A lot of modern mathematics, all of probability, a good chunk of probability theory is based on this. This is a key relationship. And if you're interested, we'll talk more about this when we get to sequences and series. Now, of course, this does not mean if you take negative one half of a person and look at how many ways you can order them, the answer is the square root of pi. What it means is there is a function that agrees with the factorial functions at the integers, but somehow makes sense for other inputs as well. And when you look at this generalized function, negative one half factorial turns out to be the square root of pi. It's a nice application of multivariable calculus to prove that, and so we'll do that later in the semester. So let's return to the derivative e to the x. Derivative of 1 is 0. What's the derivative of x? 1. Derivative of x squared 2x. We have 2x over 2 factorial, 2 times 1. x cubed is 3x squared over 3 times 2 factorial. Derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed over 4 times 3 factorial. And I'm just using n factorial is n times n minus 1. I'm trying to set myself up for some really nice algebra. So I get 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed 2 factorial over 3 factorial plus dot, 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 dot. What function is that? What function is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial? It's the function we started with. It's e to the x. So here is a proof that e to the x has derivative e to the x. And the proof basically just involves taking the derivative term by term and noting that n factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial. This makes sense for any value of x. I can put an x equals square root of 2, and this makes sense because I just have root 2, root 2 squared, root 2 cubed. I can do that for any number. Now, this doesn't seem to be my day to do good, rigorous mathematics. I have just made a mistake comparable to what caused the collapse of Western civilization, the big banking errors. I did one of the biggest whoopsies in mathematics. I did one of the biggest no-nos. What did I do wrong? There is a step here that, cannot, that has to be justified that I did not justify. What did I slip past you? Yes. No. We, we, OK, so we're going to accept this as the definition of e to the x and that the series converges. You're absolutely right that that's something that has to be justified, and we will do that later in the semester. But there's a calculus mistake that I've done. What's the first differentiation rule I used? How did I get from this line to this line? What did I do? Yes. Yeah, but that, that's fine. I mean, 2 factorial is defined as 2 times 1. 3 factorial is defined as 3 times 2 times 1. So having these as constants and using the constant rule is no problem. But I used a rule of calculus before I got to the constant rule. What was the first rule I used to get from here to here? Yes? Um, did you say that the derivative of 1 is 0? No, I used something even before that. What was the very first? What rule did I use to get from this line to this line? Yes? I used the sum rule. I said the derivative of a sum, well, actually, I said the derivative of an infinite sum is the infinite sum of the derivatives. In calculus 1 and 2, you never proved that theorem. The reason you never proved that theorem is that theorem is sometimes false. There are cases where the derivative of an infinite sum is not the infinite sum of the derivatives. You have to be very, very careful whenever you have infinities. In this case, it can be justified but it has to be justified, okay? And that's why there's a little bit of a leap here. I have to justify the derivative of an infinite sum is the infinite sum of the derivatives. So what I want to do now is I want to give you an application of why we care about the chain rule. So, you know, again, whenever you see something in mathematics, the question is always, well, who cares about this? The chain rule is extremely useful. The goal is to have a function of a bunch of variables and those variables will be functions of other variables. So as your base variables change, the next level of variables change, and that propagates up to the change of the function you care about. But there's another application, they're off again, there's another application that we care about. It's called 
derivatives of inverse functions. And it's a nice application of the chain rule. So imagine a of x is f of g of x, and these functions are so special, they're complementary. They're inverse functions to each other, and f of g of x is equal to x. I, well, by the chain rule, a prime of x is f prime at g of x times g prime of x. All right, I did one side, you do the other. What's the derivative of x? <coughs> derivative of x, 1. So we can solve for g prime. So g prime of x is 1 over f prime of g of x if f of g of x equals x. Trust me, this is a beautiful relationship. It allows us to calculate the derivative of g prime if we know the derivative of its inverse. So for example, consider the function exponential of the natural log of x. That's equal to x. The exponential and natural log functions are inverses of, them, of each other. Therefore, the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over the derivative of the exponential function evaluated the natural log of x. But we just calculated the derivative of the exponential function. What's the derivative of the exponential function? It's the exponential function, right? Differentiate it as many times as you want. It's itself. So we get 1 over the exponential function of the natural log of x. Oh, but the exponential of the natural log of x is just 1 over x. We've now computed the derivative of the natural log of x. This is how you get the derivative of natural log. If you know the derivative of the exponential, you get the derivative of the natural log for free. As another example, can someone tell me what is the tangent of the arc tangent of x? It's x, right? The arc tangent of x is the angle whose tangent of x. So I take the tangent of the angle whose tangent is x. Well, the tangent of the angle whose tangent of x is just x. You can use this to calculate the derivative of arctangent. And so that's a wonderful formula to find as a nice problem. You know, try to figure out what is the derivative of arctangent. OK, so this is the chain rule in one dimension. So now what we need is we need the chain rule in several dimensions. And so the notation is going to get a lot more involved. It's going to get a lot messier. There's going to be a lot more terms to look at. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to state the chain rule in its full glory. And then I'm going to talk about how to find a good mnemonic to remember what the answer is. So before I can state the chain rule, I have to just describe the framework of the problem. So here, I'm going to have f as a function from rn to r. So how many inputs does f require? So if f is a function from rn to r, how many inputs is f looking for? n. n. OK, so I have f needs n inputs. I'm going to let w be a function from rm to r. So w is going to require <coughs> m inputs. And I'm going to look at w of u1 through um. It's going to be f of x1 of u1 through um, comma, dot, 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 comma, xn of u1 through um. So this makes sense, so long as it's we're OK, so long as x1 through xn are functions from rm to r. So what's going on is you give me some values u1 through um. I used those to get my values x1 through xn. <coughs> and now that I have those values, I can feed that into f. And that's going to give me a function that takes m inputs and gives me one output. OK? So I want to figure out how w changes with respect to one of the variables, say ui. 
and we want to try to think what should be the ingredients in the answer. All right, so if you think about it, if we go back to one dimension, we had f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So the question is, how do you think f prime generalizes? So what do you think f prime generalizes to? So what kind of derivatives do we expect to see? You know, before we had df dx, and so now we should see things like df dx1, df dx2. So the answer is going to be df dx1 times dx1 dui plus df dx2 dx2 dui plus dot 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 plus df dxn dxn dui. Okay. I'll resist the bad joke. Okay. When we have a formula like this, we have to remember where do we evaluate? So we have all these different f's, df dx1, df dx2, df dxn. Where are we evaluating these functions? Where do we evaluate df dx1? At what point? So again, in one dimensional calculus, this was the biggest mistake. It's f prime at g of x. Where do we evaluate df dx1? At what point? There's only one point it can be. So what point would be your, do you have a thought? Or? Where did we evaluate f? So where was f evaluated at? At x1 of u1 comma um, xn of u1 to um. We have to evaluate these partials at the same place we evaluated f, right? Just like in one variable, we evaluated f prime at the same place we evaluate f, we have to evaluate these partials at the same place we evaluated f. So if we evaluated f at this point, so these must be at the point um, x1 of u1 through um dot 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 xn of u1 through um. And we're going to use this point so many times. Let's give this point a name. Let's call this point g of u1 through um. My hand is getting tired. It's been a long technical lecture. So let's call it g of u1 through um. That's the point where we're evaluating f. That also now makes this look a lot more like the one-dimensional chain rule f of g of u1 through um. So now we know where we're evaluating the f's. Now we have to figure out where do we evaluate the x's. So this is at the point. So where would we evaluate dx dui? dx1 dui, dx2 dui, dxn dui. Where are these evaluated? It's got to be the same place where the x's are evaluated. Where do we evaluate the x's? U1 through n. So this has to be at the point u1, u2, um. Okay. So if you think back to the one-dimensional rule, it will always remind you where to evaluate. It's f prime at g of x. So I have to evaluate df dx1 at g of blah. And then these ones have to be at the point u. All right. There's a more compact notation. So again, g, I'm going to let g of u be g of u1, un. So u is u1, I'm sorry, um, is u1, um, is this vector. I'm getting tired of writing u1 through um. So let's use our vector notation. We spent some time at the beginning of the semester doing vectors. So we have the function w of u is equal to f of g of u. 
except for the fact that I'm using the letter U instead of X and I have an arrow over it, doesn't this look like the one-dimensional chain rule? Now the one-dimensional chain rule was F prime at G of X times G prime. What do we get here? DW DU1 DUI is going to be um, df dx1 at g of u times dx1 du1 at the point u plus dot 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 plus df dxn at the point g of u times dxn d u i. I'm sorry, this is a u i. Okay. So let's look at what we have. df dx1, df dx2, df dxn. What does that look like? Yes? It looks like f prime. So this looks a lot like the derivative of f at the point g of u. Right? Now the next one is basically the derivative of g with respect to u1. So it's kind of looking like the derivative of g with respect to u1. But what we have to remember here now is this is going to be a vector and we're going to be having a dot product. And so we'll talk a little bit more about notation like this when we get to the section on directional derivatives. But structurally, you can see that this is looking a lot like the one-dimensional chain rule. So one of the things the book does well, in fact, I hadn't seen this until I started teaching 105, was a nice mnemonic to remember how to figure out what the derivatives are. So useful mnemonic. So we're going to have W of uv is f of x of uv, y of uv, z of uv. So to cut down on notation, I'm going to assume that f depends on three variables. And rather than writing x1, x2, x3, let's just write it as x, y, z, you know, things you're more familiar with seeing. And instead of having u1 through um, let's just use u and v. And so the way it works is you start off here with w. And then in the next line, you write all the variables that w depends on. And you draw a line from w to these variables. And then in the next line, you write all the variables that x, y, and z depend on. And you draw lines. So here's x, here's y, here's z. And this is a nice mnemonic to remember what the correct partial derivatives are. So to get from here to here, I differentiate with respect to x. So I get df dx, df dy, df dz. To get from here to here, I differentiate with respect to u. And I'll get dx du, this will be dx dv, dy du, dy dv, dz du, dz dv. That's how it will be. And so if I want to figure out how does w change with respect to u, I circle u and I look at all paths that get me to u. I can go boom, boom, boom. And I multiply as I go down and then I just add up the contributions. And so I'll get dw du is going to be df dx dx du plus df dy dy du plus df dz dz du. It's the same as what I had before, but the hope is that this becomes a nice way for you to remember the order to take the derivatives, how to multiply together, what to add. You do not need to write down this chart to do the derivatives. By all means, feel free to just jump to the statement of the chain rule. But what we're saying is, well, look, I want to know how w changes with respect to u. 
first I see how f changes with respect to x, and then remember that x changes with respect to u, and I have to multiply by that conversion factor. And this is just like the g prime of x in the one-dimensional chain rule. Then over here that I have to remember, well, but I could also, instead of changing, when I change u, it's not just x that could change, but y could also change. So I also have df dy times dy du. And finally, I have, well, if I change u, z might change. So I get the contribution from how f changes with respect to z times dz du. Right. So this is the multivariable chain rule. Okay. The least favorite part of the course. So now that we have this, we should clearly do an example. And so I'm gonna, we should have enough time to just barely finish one example. That's how bad this rule is. And I want to show you in this example why I hate the book's notation. So the book says, let's let w equal x cosine x squared plus y squared. x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta. I happen to think this is very bad notation. It's confusing. x depends on r and theta. Is w a function of x and y? Is it a function of r and theta? To me, when I look at this, it's not so clear. I much prefer to write w as a function of r and theta is going to be x of r theta cosine x of r theta squared plus y of r theta squared. Well, if I want to get this into the notation for the chain rule, let's let f of x, y be my function x cosine x squared plus y squared. The x equals r cosine theta is convenient shorthand notation, but really x is a function of two variables. So let's write x of r theta is r cosine theta. y of r theta is r sine theta. It is painful to be this notationally explicit, but it does minimize the probability of making an error. So I do urge you to be careful. Introduce this auxiliary function f, even though we don't really need it. I think it cuts down on errors. So now w of r theta is going to be f of x of r theta y of r theta. All right. And I want to calculate dw d theta. For some reason, this is the goal of my life. I need to know dw d theta. What do we know that would allow us to compute dw d theta? Do we know anything that could help us calculate dw d theta? We don't know anything that could help us calculate it? Haven't seen anything today that could be useful? The chain rule, right? In a lecture on the chain rule with a problem, it's almost surely going to be the case that the chain rule will be useful, right? So what we have is we have a function w here. We have x and y. We have r and theta. And so I have df dx dx d theta, dx dr, dy dr, dy d theta, df dy. And I want to get down here. So I get dw d theta is df dx, dx d theta, plus df dy, dy d theta. And I have to be careful. I have to remember where am I evaluating things. I evaluate these at the point x of r theta, y of r theta, which is r cosine theta, r sine theta. That's where I'm evaluating the df dx, df dy terms. What about the dx dy? I'm sorry, the dx d theta and the dy d theta. Where do I evaluate these? At what point do I evaluate dx d theta? So again, you need to know where you're evaluating the points when you're using the chain rule. 
We have to evaluate df dx at the same place we evaluated f. We have f of x of r theta, y of r theta, so we have to evaluate f at the point x of r theta, y of r theta. Where do we evaluate dx d theta? It has to be at the same point we evaluated x. What is that point? So where did we evaluate x? I'm sorry, I think I heard so. Yep, so, so, so what's the point where we evaluate x? It's r theta. So we have to evaluate these at r theta, and these are at x of r theta, y of r theta. So you have to keep track of where you're evaluating things. This is one of the biggest mistakes in the chain rule. You know, we have f prime of g of x. You evaluate f prime at the same place you evaluated f. We have g prime of x. You evaluate g prime at the same place you evaluated g. So here, this stuff over here, this is behaving like my g of r theta. And so I still have to evaluate df dx df dy at that point. Then I evaluate dx and d, dx d theta and dy d theta at the point r theta. All right, so now let's calculate some derivatives. So we have df dx. All right, all right so we take the derivatives, we use the product rule, we get 1 times cosine of x squared plus y squared plus x. Now the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so this becomes a minus sine of x squared plus y squared. And then when I take the derivative of x squared plus y squared with respect to x, I get 2x, so this becomes a negative 2x squared. df dy, a similar calculation is going to give me uh, negative 2xy sine x squared plus y squared. dx d theta, what's the derivative of x with respect to theta? So dx d theta would be what? Negative r sine theta, excellent. And similarly, dy d theta would be uh, r cosine theta. But now we have to remember we want to evaluate df dx at this point, at r cosine theta, r sine theta. So we have, it's nice to have a long blackboard, df dx at the point r cosine theta, r sine theta. All right. So we have r squared cosine squared plus r squared sine squared. Oh, cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. This becomes cosine of r squared. So we get cosine of r squared minus 2 r squared cosine squared theta sine of r squared. The fun continues. We get df dy of r cosine theta, r sine theta is equal to negative 2 r squared cosine theta sine theta sine of r squared. The next one's actually better. dx d theta at the point r theta is just what? So what's dx d theta at the point r theta? So if you look at what we have here, what's dx d theta at r theta? Yes. Yeah, it's just what we have here, right? So these ones are actually no problem. It's these ones that are pain. Because we have df dx in terms of x and y, and then we have to replace the x's and y's with r's and thetas. Here we've already got things in terms of r. And so this is just minus r sine theta. Oh, my hand really is hurting. Wow. Uh, let's see. That's not horrible. No, that is horrible there. Is equal to r. Uh, it's been a long lecture. Cosine of theta. All right. <laughs> and now we take these monstrosities and we feed them in here and we get our answer. And of course, we do some algebra and we simplify. 
but wait, according to my clock, we have one minute left. We just realized there's a better way to do this problem. So this will give us dw d theta. There was a better way to get dw d theta. We did not need to do this. No, I can't cancel out the dx's. That would give me df d theta. f is not a function of theta. And in fact, that's why you had the homework problem where you had the ideal gas law, and you saw that that triple product of partials was negative 1 and not 1. So that was a very good thing to say. You can't just cancel the dx's. But you can in one variable. In one variable, you can kind of cancel, but not in several variables. Yes? Um, can we go back to the original equation? Yes. Yeah, screw the chain rule, right? Erase it. Goodbye. Look, I tell you x is r cosine theta. I tell you y is r sine theta. So just calculate w directly as a function of r and theta. w of r theta, x is just r cosine theta. And then you get x squared plus y squared is just r squared. Calculate dw d theta. That's not so bad. Right? Just take the derivative of this with respect to theta. Just take a partial derivative. So why did I do this to you? There will be cases where you cannot just substitute directly. And you want to be able to compound to calculate the compound derivative in terms of the constituent parts. As a theoretical tool, the chain rule is very useful. But sometimes you can check your work. You're fortunate enough to be able to check your work and put things in directly. So the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So when you do all the algebra simplification, that's what you should get. OK? So the chain rule will give you the right answer, but it's not always the best thing to do. Remember my favorite New England transcendentalist, the great Henry David Thoreau. Simplify, simplify. Before you do a long calculation, ask yourself, is there a better way? And often the answer is yes. All right, if you have not picked up your homework or solution keys, please do so. Um,